Welcome, I'm Denise Graves, and you're watching Opera America's Oral History Project. Thank you, Paulette Haupt, for taking time from your day today to talk to me about your career in opera. Uh, opera America at its 50th anniversary in 2020, cut short by COVID. Um, we wanted to capture interviews with 50 people we believe have made a really indelible impression on American opera. And you are one of them. And I'm just so happy that as we pick this project back up, that you're able to be with us today. Me too. Uh, so Paulette, I, I start every interview by asking who, who brought you to your first opera? Well, I was a piano major at the University of Denver and Roger Dexter Fee was the dean of music, a uh, dean of dean of the music school, and he was also the chorus master for Central City Opera. And he hired me in 1964 mm -hmm, uh, to to come up and be his assistant. So he took me to my first operas, which were Madame Butterfly and Robert Ward's The Lady of, from Colorado. Wow, uh, it, it's amazing that even in your first opera season, you were doing American opera. It kind of paves the way. Exactly. Did, did, this, did opera strike you as you know, an exciting multimedia art form you wanted to get involved with, or were you a little skeptical at first after that season at Central City? I was instantly in love with opera, instantly. What it about just, it? It just really emotionally spoke to me in every way and um, I loved it. I just loved it. So from piano to conducting, what, what led you into the realm of conducting? Well, I, um, uh, Timothy Nolan, my husband at the time, and I worked at Lake George Opera several times. And um, Paul Calloway, the conductor for the Barber of Seville in 1973, became ill and I was handed the baton. Being left-handed, I didn't know what hand to hold it in. But I did make my debut at with the Barber of Seville in Lake George, 1973. Wow. And, and, and at the time, Lake George had I always had an interesting repertoire. I guess David Lloyd was the head of the company at that time. He was. Well, uh, yes, he was, absolutely. And David Lloyd, an important American singer uh, in some important world premieres of him of, at, at New York City Opera back in the day. Uh, and he ran for many years Lake George Opera with an eye toward, toward American opera. Yes, he did. Yes, he did, certainly. <laughs> so Barbara Seville uh, conducting, but that was 1974. So you, you, conduct, you took to conducting because you, you, you went on as a conductor. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I, I went from Lake George to Kansas City, a lyric opera. Uh, to, I don't know what happened right after that, uh, but I was uh, at San Francisco Opera for a number of years and ended up conducting Carmen at San Francisco Opera in 1977. Wow. And I, that, yet, that's... there were barriers. Yeah, oh. I was going to ask you about that, <laughs> you know, because you know, in the 1970s, you know, conducting was for, you know, for worse, a man's realm. I mean, you must have had to really push against the tide. Most of the time, I just ignored it. I just thought this is not, this is not, I don't, I don't like being the first woman at doing anything. Uh, but I, mo most of the time I was able to ignore it. But some of the barriers became unignorable. <laughs> Uh, when it was, it had to do mostly with um, male conductors who felt they should be in my position. It was very rarely from the orchestra players themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Very rarely. Um, but it happened a few times. It happened in Cleveland and uh, San Francisco Opera to an extent and to, in Boston University. Um, so it happened. But as I say, most of the time I just ignored it and knew the score so well, nobody could fault that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, it's interesting because Lake George had a pedigree at the time of doing American opera, as did Kansas City, Lyric Opera Kansas City, under Russell Patterson. Yeah. They did. Um, the, one of the years I conducted their Flatermouse, probably, uh, they were doing Sheldon Harnick and, and Jack Beeson's Captain Jinx and the Horse Marines, which never had a second production, which we can talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, and of course, at Lake George uh, and at Kansas City at the time, those, uh, all, everything was in English. Yes, it was something that has diminished over time with the introduction of all the translation systems. Yes, but I think it had, all, it, has all, it had always been a hindrance with audiences who didn't know the language. You know, yeah. Yeah. that's what I love about musical theater is that it most often is in a language we understand already. We don't have to work to understand the story. Yeah. 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 But subtitles so, certainly helped. There was, I, I remember Opera American conferences where there was great discussion about subtitles. And mm -hmm. the, the big new thing, it was. Absolutely. And uh, sure you certainly do too. disagreement about, you know, it's being distracting from the stage action. Absolutely. With a truth, but, you know, there you have, you know, Perhaps everything has a little price to it, and the distraction from the stage, you know, and traded off against understanding what's going on. Yeah. Sadly, today, because in the Broadway theaters, um, it's so hard to understand the words sometimes that they do subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. it, so, you know, Paulette, I, I first knew you in the late 1970s you know, a long time ago in Philadelphia. And new opera, clearly, you may have conducted Carmen at San Francisco Opera and the Barber of Seville at Lake George Opera, but how did new work become a focus for you? What, what, what about it, what, what brought you to that specialty? Well, I'll tell you, new work for me started really at the O'Neill as well as Opera America, but at the O'Neill Theater Center, I became aware that there were composers who were still living <laughs> and really deserved to be heard. Um, in the 70s, you know, I, I can now say I've reached the age of wisdom. And at the age of wisdom, you could think back and you thought, oh, I knew that a long time ago. But the reality was, um, reality is, Wayne Gretzky, I'm a big hockey fan. Okay. And Wayne Gretzky said, I always skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And I think opera in the 70s was the opposite. It was yeah. going to where opposite, opera had been and not where it's going to be. That changed exponentially with Optiab, with yep. the yep. 80s and beyond. It really did. Really and I, I wanted to, to ask you about the, the environment, the opera scene back in, in the 70s. There you were conducting in San Francisco, in Kansas City. You'd been at Lake George. Um, what was the environment for new American opera? Um, was it not being composed or was it composed but not performed? Was it performed reluctantly? What, what, was, the, what was the atmosphere like for American opera in the 70s? It was very much on the fringe. It was not being done in opera companies. It was more being experimented with in other companies. It really, it really was on the fringe until um, 
as you mentioned or, or wrote, uh, when NOI started at Kennedy Center with John Ludwig. That really turned the corner. No, uh, and, and then NOI, for standing for National Opera Institute, uh, established by Roger Stevens when this Kennedy Center was established. And of course, those of us of a certain age remember the National Opera Institute. Can, can, what was it? What was it? What, what did it do and get started? It partly started because of Hal Prince. Hal Prince was very involved with NOI in the beginning. And um, he had a lot to do with it. My, my involvement with NOI was um, Roger Ames Amarantha. Roger Ames, a composer that really um, has been ignored and has now passed away. Yeah. Um, but Roger Ames Amaranta came, came to NOI and that's where I first conducted it. It was at the O'Neill in 1980 as well. But, um, oh no, NOI had major contributions to, to new music theater. It really, it, it, really it, it launched the discussion. I mean, I, I remember in my it, early it, career, those it, the symposia that NOI conducted about new opera, that it, it really propelled people to start thinking about how do we make opera an American art form? Yes, it did. You knew John Ludwig, who ran NOI. T tell, us, tell us about John. Oh, John was a, a real go-getter. I mean, he was uh, Minnesota Opera, right? Yeah, he, he, and he started the Walker Art Center in Minnesota Opera, right? Uh, right, and he, he was a real leader and one of, one of the people I admired so much, along with David DeCura and David Gockley. Mm -hmm. My God, these, these men were so important. I wanted, I wanted to be like them. I didn't want to be them, but I wanted to be like them. They were, they were really visionaries. And speaking of visionaries, we should talk about Edward Korn. Please do. I, Edward, you know, Ed was my first boss out of college at, in Philadelphia, what was the Opera Company of Philadelphia. Where uh, we tell, met. Where tell, we met. Exactly. D d tell, tell us about Ed. Well, um, I was a, a rehearsal pianist at Western Opera Theater and Ed was uh, the general manager. And uh, when he left West uh, San Francisco, he went to, um, where'd he go next? Opera he went Company to the Met. Hello. Oh, no, he went to the Met first, didn't he? And then Opera, Philadelphia, Opera Company Philadelphia. Really? I th I, he was at the Met for a few years. I don't know what order, but he was at the Met for a few years. Yeah, yeah. And he was truly my mentor. He, he, he took me to so many places I would never have gone before. Um, we went to, well, it was because of Ed Korn that I was asked to start the O'Neill Music Theater Conference. It was because of him totally. And it was because of Ed Korn, I went to China and conducted The Music Man. Uh, it was because of Ed Korn for so, so many reasons. He just, he was, he was really my number one and still is mentor, or still is. We, we can still have mentors we think about. We, we, we can still have mentors we think about. Uh, and Ed was a real, a real believer in American opera or the potential for American opera. Oh, yes. And he, yes, and he was so adamant about musicals and operas not being any different <laughs> at NEA he wanted to start the opera music theater program. I don't think that ever happened. It did, it did. It actually, it did for, it lasted for about 10 years, a little more. Oh, it did. Yep. And that was because of Ed. And once again, Hal France helping around the edges of that, really pushing for that program. And I think the first program director of it was Jim Ireland. 
Oh my God, that's a name I'd forgotten. Yes, of yeah. course. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then and then Ed moved from Philadelphia to Washington to to run the program. That's right. Good grief. So Paulette, you know interesting talking about the past. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, what take us to then the Eugene O'Neill Center? How how did that come into being and with what goal? Uh, George White, the founder of the O'Neill, called Ed Korn and said, We've got a very good playwrights conference in place now. We're helping playwrights develop their work. We want to find someone who would help us to start an opera music theater conference. Ed suggested me, and that began another 40 years of my career with the O'Neill. That was all because of Ed. Um, and Ed, Ed was very, at the first, the first couple of or three years of the O'Neill, it was the, it was a joint, it was a collaboration between the Opera Company of Philadelphia and the O'Neill. And then it kind of, we kind of branched off into more mm, hybrid works, musicals, yep. but um, Ed was instrumental in all of that. And we we just talked all the time about the difference between operas and musicals. Um, he was just so adamant that there was no difference at all. My favorite two stories are Sondheim said, Sweeney Todd is an opera when it's done in an opera house and it's a musical when it's done at a Broadway theater. Or even my more favorite, um, I worked with Anton Coppola. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that name? Sure. Anton uh, was a major conductor in both operas and musicals. And he said, the difference between operas and musicals are, if I'm conducting an opera, I get a large dressing room right by the stage large enough to have guests come in. If I'm directing a musical, I'm shown to the boiler room and a nail and they tell me that's where I can have. <laughs> I just lost you. Did I lose you? Yeah, I, I can see you and I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, Anton would be shown to, shown to the boiler room in a little room off the boiler room. Right. So in, in terms of starting the program at the O'Neill, what, what what was your goal there? What did, what did you want to achieve at the O'Neill? I wanted to learn about the process and help with the process of developing work, not producing it. We never had an opening night at the O'Neill ever, uh, but to find a way to enable composers and librettists and playwrights to hear their work and see their work in front of an audience while it was still in progress. And the goal was to help them find their way through as many days or weeks that we could offer them and leave with as many questions as they came with, but many answers as well. And that was the goal. And it, it, it finding that process took time, yeah. but it, yeah. it, it really worked. Is there a process difference? Not a, you know, if there's no difference between opera and musical, musical theater in, in the Ed Korn book, is there a difference in the process of developing them? Well, I'll tell you, when we did operas at the O'Neill, like something, something New for the Zoo by Lee Hoiby, which should have had a second production, <laughs> um, people would come up already knowing their scores. And so, you know, we were ahead of the game to some extent. Musical theater, they're not allowed to get a score until they arrive. So that process took a little longer, but we found a way to weave, weave whatever process was for them into the, into the development. At the time, 
workshops, readings, all of that in terms of the opera world were really quite unknown. If an opera had a premiere, it was rehearsal, rehearsal, plop on the stage. Um, so you really pioneered the whole concept of a developmental process to allow the creators to observe their work while it was in development. Well, thank you. I think also Opera for the 80s and Beyond helped that process a lot, a lot. Opera for the 80s and Beyond turned Opera America around yep. completely. And that was a program and, and David DiChiara was the board chair at the time and you know, yes. Howard Klein and, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund just helped and Howard, another believer in this work. Uh, yep. Our good friend, still our good friend, Ben Crywaz was an Opera America staff person that began that program to support and, workshops and developmental and process. And Ferris and Bob Darling, right? Yep, absolutely. We're also involved. Yep, um, I'm, I'm in touch with both of them. And uh, I'm, I'm always so glad to hear from Anne. She's terrific. Um, sure is. So yeah, the, the Opera for the 80s and Beyond program started in the mid 1980s, provided funding at different stages of a work to help people get into the habit of thinking about workshops. I know, I remember being flown to Detroit uh, by David DiChiara to meet with a composer that he wouldn't have been able to meet with and talk to unless Oftiab came into that process. And uh, so it really started dialogues with impresarios, our artistic directors and creators that never would have happened without Opera for the 80s and beyond. Yep. It was yep. major. And I had, uh, um, Leon Major and I had worked on editing it and I had never seen this. Oh my goodness, yes. Until this week, just amazing, the yep. information in here. Yep. Uh, everybody should buy this. <laughs> oh, you know, it, and it, it, we, we have a supply of them. It's a wonderful publication that documents that marvelous program. Oh, it's the great. And beyond. It's just great. I just love getting it. You've mentioned a couple of times now the second production yeah. as a concept. So I, my, I'm guessing that you would say that it's wonderful that we have all these workshops and funding for new work, but that you wish we saw more second productions. Am, am I reading your mind correctly there? The big part of conversations in the 70s, a big part. Um, as I mentioned, Lee Hoiby, he didn't have second productions of almost anything. Summer and Smoke to some yeah. extent, but he wrote so many other things like something new for the zoo. Um, Dominic Argento, I don't think he had very many second productions. Um, as I mentioned, Jack Beeson and Sheldon Harnett, surely, and, and Sheldon's still around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they never had a second production of their opera. And I don't think the lady from Colorado way back in Central City, uh, Robert Ward. I don't think it ever had a second production. So it was, it was a, a big part of the discussions. And it was a big concern at that time. And I think still is. Uh, is it? Absolutely, because you know, Paulette, you can find generous donors for a premiere the premiere is covered in the media. A second production, although it may enable the creators to refine and adjust the work and make a better opera, it, the second production doesn't have quite the, the appeal to donors or to the media. Wow. That's so sad. Or, I didn't or realize that was still ongoing. <laughs> Yeah, or the second production comes 25 years later. Uh, you know, even, right. you know, Nixon in China was premiered, went a couple of places, but then kind of went to sleep for a long period of time until it was reproduced. Um, 
The Ghost of Versailles, the same thing. And, and with some other productions, John Corleano made a, a somewhat smaller version of it to make it more producible. Uh, we have found that sometimes it takes a while until a producer picks up a work that premiered 20 or 25 years ago. Willie Stark. Yep. Did it never happen again? I don't think so. You know, oh, or could, if once or twice, not not since, right? Really, we could write a long list. I would say that today there is some more co-production, so that to get a new opera off the ground, three or four or five companies will co-produce it, so that within that year or two, the work goes to several cities. Wow. But it's all kind of that first production momentum. Right, right. The, you, you now work as, as a mentor, uh, as a... Well, that's interesting. Um, when I left the O'Neill and, and came back to New York permanently to start my, to grow my company premieres in New York, um, I wanted to find something else to keep me off the streets. And I do love mentoring very much and working with composers and playwrights. So I started the music theater mentor program, but it it didn't last long because of the pandemic. Because most of the most of the people that came to me were looking for venues to develop their work. And all of the contacts I had for them said, we're not looking at anything right now. We don't even know what we're doing next month. Yeah. So I, I'm not doing so much of that anymore, but it was, it was something that was very passionate for me at the time. Are there themes to the advice that you provide young composers or librettists or producers? Uh, advice as a, a wise developer of new work as a as a musician with such a scope what do you what do you tell them when they come to you well i tell them surprise me just surprise me send me something that i've not read before or heard before it doesn't sound like anybody else um, i'm interested in what's going on in your head and your heart. And that's basically it. Um, venue wise, um, you know, don't, don't write for a Broadway hit or an off Broadway hit, write for the people that you want to see this work and just let it go where it goes. Mm -hmm. Would Ed Korn be happy with what he sees in the American opera repertoire today? I think he'd be thrilled. I think he would definitely be very pleased, as would John Ludwig and everyone who's not with us anymore. Yes, I do. Um, even though I'm not living in the opera world anymore, sadly, and I have to tell you, I miss it. Uh, I'm not living in it, but I certainly sense that there's major progress and stuff happening out there that I'd like, I'd like to see more of. But yeah, I guess I think John and Ed would be very very exciting it's a, it's a very different world than than it was back in the in the 1970s when Absolutely. when you and they were such trailblazers yeah so um you're you're back in new york full time and hopefully this pandemic will will pass and and um you know and, and we'll get back to some kind of normal performance production activity but as you as you think back over these decades, um, are there any other? You've talked a lot about Ed, John. Are there any other people you remember as we walk down memory lane together, of folks who really helped guide 
the development of American opera as we know it. You've mentioned Roger Ames, who, you know, an old friend of Opera America, Lee Hoyby and his wonderful works. Uh, others you would hope that we remember? Thomas Passatieri. I uh, admired his work so much in the 70s. And at, when I was at Lake George, um, artistic directing, we worked very hard to try and get Black Widow to come to the to Lake George, um, but then I guess he had gone into film by then. But I think he's he's an overlooked guy that really maybe I, I know he's still around, but I think people should think about Thomas Pierre Passatieri as a as a commission or whatever. Oh gosh, so many others. Is Ned Roram still around? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Ned, you know, Ned has done so much vocal work. Um, you know, not as much opera. That's a terrible thing to ask. <laughs> oh, really? More what? More, more songs. More, great, great with the song literature, but a wonderful, uh, wonderful composer in the song literature. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope Roger Ames finds his due. He has a, a, a plethora of new work that has not really been heard or seen yet. Not to, I mean, not even Amarantha, which didn't go past NOI. Yeah. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done out there, but Opera America is doing it. We're, we're trying, we're trying. Um, Paulette, if we succeed, it's because we're walking in the footsteps that you laid down in this in this terrain. Uh, you know, you really, I remember your energy when I was at Opera Company of Philadelphia in the late 70s and just your, your energy and your vision. Um, of course, Ed and his, you know, energy. Um, but if we have today achieved something, it's because of the early work that, that you and Ed and others did. Thank you. You mentioned footsteps. I only wear a size six. Well, they're, they're, it's a big size six. It's a big size six. <laughs> Paulette, it's great to talk to you today. Thank you so much for spending the time mm -hmm. and for sharing some of these wonderful memories and, and frankly, some, some people want to connect with and, and include in our oral history. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure. Um, orchestrators, orchestrators uh, composers used to orchestrate their own work. Yes. Uh, always. But currently, I would imagine that most contemporary composers who are writing operas are not orchestrating their own work. Au contraire. Is, mo most of them are orchestrating their own they work. They are. Oh. Yep. yep. The, it, is, it is the rare exception, you know, because we still make grants for new work. So we see all of these applications and it is the rare exception when a composer is not doing the orchestration. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. There's lots of disagreement about whether they compose straight to full score, the way Carla Floyd always composed to full score or whether they do right. first piano and then orchestrate. So there's always a big discussion about that, but most of the composers you hear of today do their own orchestration. Wow, that's great. That's why it takes three years to do an opera. That, no, that's right, that's right. So if I were to go to an opera next week, what should I see? Goodness gracious, um, there are so many interesting new works that are that are out there right now. And what's kind of wonderful, Paulette, is the, the, the variety of scope and uh, style. So, you know, whether it's Janine Tesori's opera Blue, which is being performed by a number of companies, the operas of Terence Blanchard, Champion and Fire Shut Up on My Bones, Kevin Putz, his opera Silent Night that won the Pulitzer Prize for music a few years ago. And well, Mark Campbell. Right. Mark, you know, libretto Mark Campbell, absolutely. 
Um, and that, you know, he has, Kevin Putz has the new opera coming at the Met, the hours this year. Um, the, the opera Fellow Travelers by Gregory Spears being performed around a lot. Laura Kaminsky's As One. Uh, Mark Campbell also was a co-librettist on that. So the, there are, some of them are large scale, like Kevin Putz's uh, opera uh, Silent Night. Some of them are small ensemble, like Laura Kaminsky's As One. Some are in the middle, uh, like Fellow Travelers or Blue. Um, so there's a real variety. Um, some of them infused with jazz, some of them really kind of rooted in the classical tradition. Then there's the whole experimental wing, you know, operas by David T. Little and Du Yun, um, the wonderful work of Huang Ro. So it, it's quite remarkable. Lovely too these days, although so sad that, he's, that he passed, the works of Daniel Catan and Florencia and Amazonas and uh, Rappuccini's daughter, really wonderful works. But again, a huge variety from experimental to romantic, um, based on literature or based on current events. There, there's a huge variety. Thank you. <laughs> and all, all of these orchestrated by the composer. All, even Janine Tesori's mm -hmm. also? Yep. Wow, good for her.